Chapter 14 of the Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Lothridge. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter 14 Liquid Air. Among common phenomena, few are more interesting than the changes undergone by the substance called water. Its usual form is a liquid. Under the influence of frost, it becomes hard as iron, brittle as glass. At the touch of fire, it passes into unsubstantial vapor. This transformation illustrates the great principle that the form of every substance in the universe is a question of heat. The metal transported from the earth to the sun would first melt and then vaporize, while well, what we here know only as vapors would in the moon turn into liquids. We notice that, as regards bulk, the most striking change is from liquid to gaseous form. In steam the atoms and molecules of water are endowed with enormous repulsive vigor. Each atom suddenly shows a huge distaste for the company of its neighbors, drives them off, and endeavors to occupy the largest possible amount of private space. Now, though, we are accustomed to see water atoms thus stirred into an activity which gives us the giant steam as servant, it has probably fallen to the lot of but few of us to encounter certain gaseous substances so utterly deprived of their self-assertiveness as to collapse into a liquid mass, in which shape they are quite strangers to us. What gaseous body do we know better than the air we breathe, and what should we less expect to be reducible to the consistency of water? Yet science has largely brought prominently into notice that strange child of pressure and cold, liquid air, of which great things are prophesied, and about which many strange facts may be told. Very likely our readers have sometimes noticed a porter uncoupling the air tube between two railway carriages. He first turns off the tap at each end of the tube, and then by a twist disconnects a joint in the center. At the moment of disconnection, what appears to be a small cloud of steam issues from the joint. This is, however, the result of cold, not heat, the two being full of highly compressed air, which by its sudden expansion develops cold sufficient to freeze any particles of moisture in the surrounding air. Keep this in mind, and also what happens when you inflate your cycle tire. The air pump grows hotter and hotter as inflation proceeds, until at last, if on metal, it becomes uncomfortably warm. The heat is caused by the forcing together of air molecules, and inasmuch as all force produces heat, your strength is transformed into warmth. In these two operations, compression and expansion, we have the key to creation of liquid air, the great power, as some say, of tomorrow. Suppose we take a volume of air and squeeze it into one one-hundredth of its original space. The combativeness of the air atoms is immensely increased. They pound each other frantically and become very hot in the process. Now by cooling the vessel in which they are, we rob them of their energy. They become quiet, but they are much closer than before. Then imagine that, all of a sudden, we let them loose again. The life has gone out of them, their heat has departed, and on separating they shiver grievously. In other words, the heat contained by the one one hundredth volume is suddenly compelled to spread itself thin over the whole volume. Result, intense cold. And if this air be brought to bear upon a second vessel filled likewise with compressed air, the cold will be even more intense, until at last the air atoms lose all their strength and collapse into a liquid. Liquid air is no new thing. Who first made it is uncertain. The credit has been claimed for several people, among them Olszewski, a Pole, and Pictet, a Swiss. As a mere laboratory experiment, the manufacture of liquid air in small quantities has been known for twenty years or more. The earlier process was one of terrific compression alone, actually forcing the air molecules by sheer strength into such close contact that their antagonism to one another was temporarily overcome. So expensive was the process that the first ounce of liquid air is estimated to have cost over 600 pounds. In order to make liquid air an article of commerce, the most important condition was a wholesale decrease in cost of production. In 1857, C. W. Siemens took out a patent for making the liquid on what is known as the regenerative principle, whereby the compressed air is chilled by expanding a part of it. Professor Duar, a scientist well known for his researches in the field of liquid gases, 
had in 1892 produced liquid air by a modification of the principle at comparatively small cost, and other inventors have since then still further reduced the expense, until at the present day there appears to be a prospect of liquid air becoming cheap enough to prove a dangerous rival to steam and electricity. A company known as the Liquid Air, Power, and Automobile Company has established large plants in America and England for the manufacture of the liquid on a commercial sale. The writer paid a visit to their depot in Gillingham Street, London, where he was shown the process by Mr. Hans Knudsen, the inventor of much of the machinery there used. The reader will doubtless like to learn the plain unvarnished truth about the creation of this peculiar liquid, and to hear of the freaks in which it indulges, if indeed those may be called freaks which are but obedience to the unchanging laws of nature. On entering the factory, the first thing that strikes the eye and ear is the monstrous fifty-horse-power gas engine pounding away with an energy that shakes the whole building. From its ponderous flywheels, great leather belts pass to the compressors, by which the air, drawn from outside the building through special purifiers, is subjected to an increasing pressure. Three dials on the wall show exactly what is going on inside the compressors. The first stands at 90 pounds to the square inch, the second at 500, the third at 2,200, or rather less than a ton, pressure on the area of a penny. The pistons of the low-pressure compressor is 10 inches in diameter, but that of the high pressure only 2 inches, or 1 25th of the area. So great is the resistance to be overcome in the last stage of compression. Now, if the cycle pump heats our hands, it will be easily understood that the temperature of compressors is very high. They are water-jacketed like the cylinders of gas engine, so that a circulating stream of cold water may absorb some of the heat. The compressed air is passed through spiral tubes, winding through large tanks of water, which fairly boils from the fierceness of the heat of compression. When the air has been sufficiently cooled, it is allowed to pass into a small chamber, expanding as it goes, and from the small into a larger chamber, where the cold of expansion becomes so acute that the air molecules collapse into liquid, which collects in a special receptacle. Arrangements are made whereby any vapor rising from the liquid passes through a space outside the expansion chamber, so that it helps to cool the incoming air and is not wasted. The liquid air tank is inside a great wooden case, carefully protected from the heat of the atmosphere by non-conducting substances. A tap being turned, a rush of vapor shoots out, soon followed by a clear bluish liquid, which is the air we breathe in fresh guise. A quantity of it is collected in a saucepan. It simmers at first, and presently boils like water on a fire. The air heat is by comparison so great that the liquid cannot resist it, and strives to regain its former condition. You may dip your finger into the saucepan, if you withdraw it again quickly, without hurt. The cushion of air that your finger takes in with it protects you against harm, but if you held it in the liquid for a couple of seconds you would be minus a digit. Pour a little over your coat sleeve, it flows harmlessly to the ground, where it suddenly expands into a cloud of chilly vapor. Put some in a test tube and cork it up. The cork soon flies out with a report, the pressure of the boiling air drives it. Now watch the boiling process the nitrogen being more volatile, as it boils at a lower temperature than oxygen, passes off first, leaving the pure blue oxygen. The temperature of this liquid is over 312 degrees below zero, as far below the temperature of the air we breathe as the temperature of molten lead is above it. A tumbler of liquid oxygen dipped into water is soon covered with a coating of ice, which can be detached from the tumbler and itself used as a cup to hold the liquid. If a bit of steel wire be now twisted round a lighted match and the hole dipped into the cup, the steel flares fiercely and fuses into small pellets, which means that an operation requiring 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit has been accomplished in a liquid 300 degrees below zero. Liquid air has curious effects upon certain substances. It makes iron so brittle that a ladle immersed for a few moments may be crushed in the hands, but curiously enough it has a toughening effect on copper and brass. Meat, eggs, fruit, and all bodies containing water become hard as steel and as breakable as glass. Mercury is by it congealed to the consistency of iron. Even alcohol that can breathe the utmost arctic cold succumbs to it. The writer was present when some thermometers, manufactured by Messrs. Negretti and Zambra, were tested with liquid air. 
the spirit in the tubes rapidly descended to 250 degrees below zero, then sank slowly, and at about 260 degrees froze and burst the bulb. The measuring of such extreme temperature is a very difficult matter in consequence of the inability of spirit to withstand them, and special apparatus, registering cold by the shrinkage of metal, must be used for testing some liquid gases, notably liquid hydrogen, which is so much colder than liquid air that it actually freezes into a solid ice form. For handling and transporting liquid gases, glass receptacles with a double skin from which all air has been exhausted are employed. The surrounding vacuum is so perfect an insulator that a dewer bulb full of liquid air scarcely cools the hand, though the intervening space is less than an inch. The fact is hard to square with the assertion of scientific men that our atmosphere extends by a hundred or two miles from the Earth's surface, and that the recesses of space are a vacuum. If it were so, how would heat reach us from the sun ninety-two millions of miles away? One use, at least, for liquid air is sufficiently obvious. As a refrigerating agent, it is unequaled. Bulk for bulk, its effect is, of course, far greater than that of ice, and it has this advantage over other freezing compounds, that whereas slow freezing has a destructive effect upon the tissues of meat and fruit, the instantaneous action of liquid air has no bad results when the thing frozen is thawed out again. The liquid air company, therefore, proposes erecting depots at large ports for supplying ships to preserve the food, cool the cabins in the tropics, and we hope to alleviate some of the horrors of the stokehold. Liquid air is already used in medical and surgical science. In surgery it is substituted for anesthetics, deadening any part of the body on which an operation had to be performed. In fever hospitals, too, its cooling influence will be welcomed and liquid oxygen takes places of compressed oxygen for reviving the flickering flame of life. It will also provide invaluable for divers and submarine boats. In combination with oil and charcoal liquid air, under the name of oxyliquid, becomes a powerful blasting agent. Cartridges of paper filled with the oil and charcoal are provided with a firing primer. When everything is ready for the blasting, the cartridges are dropped into a vessel full of liquid air, saturated, placed in position, and exploded. Mr. Knudsen assured the writer that oxyliquid is twice as powerful as nitroglycerin, and its cost but one-third of that of the other explosive. It is also safer to handle, for in case of a misfiring, the cartridge becomes harmless in a few minutes after the liquid air has evaporated. But the greatest use will be found for liquid air when it exerts its force less violently. It is the result of power, its condition is abnormal, and its return to its ordinary state is accompanied by a great development of energy. If it be placed in a closed vessel, it is capable of exerting a pressure of 12,000 pounds to the square inch. Its return to atmospheric conditions may be regulated by exposing it more or less to the heat of the atmosphere. So long as it remains liquid, it represents so much stored force like the electricity stored in accumulators. The Liquid Air Company have at their Gillingham Street Depot a neat little motor car worked by liquid air. A copper reservoir, carefully protected, is filled with a liquid, which is by mechanical means squirted into coils, in which it rapidly expands, and from there passes to the cylinders. A charge of 18 gallons will move the car 40 miles at an average pace of 12 miles an hour, without any of the noise, dirt, smell, and vapor inseparable from the employment of steam or petroleum. The speed of the car is regulated by the amount of liquid injected into the expansion coils. We now come to the question of cost, the unromantic balance in which new discoveries are weighed and many found wanting. The storage of liquid air is feasible for long periods. A large vacuum bulb, filled and exposed to the atmosphere, had some of the liquid still unevaporated at the end of twenty-two days. But will it be too costly for ordinary practical purposes now served by steam and electricity? The managers of the Liquid Air Company, while deprecating extravagant prophecies about the future of their commodity, are nevertheless confident that it has come to stay. With this small fifty-horsepower plant, its production costs upwards of one shilling a gallon, but with much larger plant of one thousand horsepower, they calculate that the expenses will be covered and a profit left if they retail it at about one penny a gallon. This great reduction in cost arises from the economizing of waste energy. 
in the first place the power of expansion previous to the liquefaction of compressed air will be utilized to work motors secondly the heat of the cooling tanks will be turned to account and even the exhaust of a motor would be cold enough for ordinary refrigerating it is of course impossible to get more out of a thing than has been put into it and liquid air will therefore not develop even as much power as required to form it but its handiness and cleanliness strongly recommended it for many purposes as we have seen and as soon as it is turned out in large quantities new uses will be found for it perhaps the day will come when liquid air motors will replace the petrol car and every village we shall see hung out the sign liquid air sold here as the french say qui vivra vera End of chapter 14、chapter、15、of the Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alistair Braid, Glasgow, Scotland. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter Fifteen: Horseless Carriages. A body of enterprising Manchester merchants in the year seventeen fifty four put on the road a flying coach, which, according to their special advertisement, would, however incredible it may appear, actually, barring accidents, arrive in London in four and a half days after leaving Manchester. According to the Lord Chancellor of the time, such swift travelling was considered dangerous as well as wonderful. The condition of the roads might well make it so. And also injurious to health. I was gravely advised, he says, to stay a day in York on my journey between Edinburgh and London, as several passengers who had gone through without stopping had died of apoplexy from the rapidity of the motion, as the coach took a fortnight to pass from the Scotch to the English capital at an average pace of between three and four miles an hour. It is probable that the Chancellor's advisers would be very seriously indisposed by the mere sight of a motor car whirling along in its attendant cloud of dust, could they be resuscitated for the purpose. And we, on the other hand, should prefer to get out and walk to flying at the safe speed of their mail coaches. The improvement of high roads and road making generally accelerated the rate of posting. In the first quarter of the nineteenth century, an average of ten or even twelve miles an hour was maintained on the Bath Road, but that pace was considered inadequate when the era of the iron horse commenced, and the decay of stage driving followed hard upon the growth of railways. What should have been the natural successor of the stage coach was driven from the road by ill-advised legislation, which gave the railroads a monopoly of swift transport, which has but lately been removed. The history of the steam coach, steam carriage, automobile, motor car, to give it its successive names, is in a manner unique, showing as it does, instead of steady development of a practical means of locomotion, a sudden and decisive check to an invention worthy of far better treatment than it received. The compiler of even a short survey of the automobile's career is obliged to divide his account into two main portions, linked together by a few solitary engineering achievements. The first period. Eighteen hundred to eighteen thirty-six will, without any desire to arrogate for England more than her due, or to belittle the efforts of any other nations, be termed the English period, since in it England took the lead and produced by far the greatest number of steam carriages. The second, eighteen seventy to the present day, may, with equal justice, be styled the continental period, as witnessing the great developments made in automobilism by French, German, Belgian, and American engineers. England, for reasons that will be presently noticed, being until quite recently too heavily handicapped to take a part in the advance. Historical, it is impossible to discover who made the first self-moving carriage. In the sixteenth century, one Johann Hostach, a Nuremberg watchmaker, produced a vehicle that derived its motive power from coiled springs and was, in fact, a large addition of our modern clockwork toys. About the same time, the Dutch, and among them especially one Simon Stephen. Fitted carriages with sails, and there are records of a steam carriage as early as the same century. But the first practical and at least semi-successful automobile driven by internal force was undoubtedly that of a Frenchman, Nicolas Joseph Cugnot, who justly merits the title of father of automobilism. His machine, which is today one of the most treasured exhibits in the Paris Museum of Arts and Crafts, consisted of a large carriage having in front a pivoted platform bearing the machinery and resting on a solid wheel. Which propelled as well as steered the vehicle. 
The boiler, of stout riveted copper plates, had below it an enclosed furnace, from which the flames passed upwards through the water through a funnel. A couple of cylinders, provided with a simple reversing gear, worked a ratchet that communicated motion to the driving wheel. This carriage did not travel beyond a very slow walking pace, and Cugnot therefore added certain improvements, after which, 1770, it reached the still very moderate speed of four miles an hour, and distinguished itself by charging and knocking down a wall, a feat that is said to have for a time deterred engineers from developing a seemingly dangerous mode of progression. Ten years later, Dallery built a steam car and ran it in the streets of Amiens. We are not told with what success, and before any further advance had been made with the automobile, the French Revolution put a stop to all inventions of a peaceful character among our neighbours. In England, however, steam had already been recognised as the coming power. Richard Trevithick, afterwards to become famous as a railroad engineer, built a steam motor in 1802 and actually drove it from Camborne to Plymouth, a distance of 90 miles. But instead of following up this success, he forsook steam carriages for the construction of locomotives, leaving his idea to be expanded by other men who were convinced that a vehicle which could be driven over existing roads was preferable to one that was helpless when separated from smooth metal rails. Between the years 1800 and 1836, many steam vehicles for road traffic appeared from time to time. Some, such as David Gordon's, propelled by metal legs pressing upon the ground, strangely unpractical, but the majority showing a steady improvement in mechanical design. As it will be impossible, without writing a small book, to name all the English constructors of this period, we must rest content with the mention of the leading pioneers of the new locomotion. Sir Goldsworthy Gurney, an eminent chemist, did for mechanical road propulsion what George Stevenson was doing for railway development. He boldly spent large sums on experimental vehicles, which took the form of six-wheeled coaches. The earliest of these were fitted with legs as well as driving wheels, since he thought that in difficult country wheels alone would not have sufficient grip. A similar fallacy was responsible for the cogged wheels on the first railways. But in the later types, legs were abandoned as unnecessary. His coaches easily climbed the steepest hills round London, including Highgate Hill, though a thoughtful mathematician had proved by calculations that a steam carriage, so far from mounting a gradient, could not, without violating all natural laws, so much as move itself on the level. Having satisfied himself of their power, Gurney took his coaches further afield. In 1829 was published the first account of a motor trip made by him and three companions through Reading, Devizes and Melksham. The pace was, we read, at first only about six miles an hour, including stoppages. They drove very carefully to avoid injury to the persons or feelings of the country folk. But at Melksham, where a fair was in progress, they had to face a shower of stones hurled by a crowd of roughs at the instigation of some coaching postillions who fear losing their livelihood if the new method of locomotion became general. Two of the tourists were severely hurt, and Gurney was obliged to take shelter in a brewery where constables guarded his coach. On the return journey, the party timed their movements so as to pass through Melksham while the inhabitants were all safely in bed. The coach ran most satisfactorily, improving every mile. Our pace was so rapid, wrote one of the company, that the horses of the mail cart which accompanied us were hard put to it to keep up with us. At the foot of Devizes Hill we met a coach and another vehicle which stopped to see us mount this hill, an extremely steep one. We ascended it at a rapid rate. The coach and passengers, delighted at this unexpected sight, honoured us with shouts of applause. In 1830, Messrs Ogle and Summers completely beat the road records on a vehicle fitted with a tubular boiler. This car, put through its trials before a special commission of the House of Commons, attained the astonishing speed of 35 miles an hour on the level, and mounted a hill near Southampton at 24 and a half miles an hour. It worked at a boiler pressure of 250 pounds to the square inch, and though not hung on springs, ran 800 miles without a breakdown. This performance appears all the more extraordinary when we remember that the roads of the day were not generally as good as they are now, and that in the previous year Stevenson's rocket, running on rails, had not reached a higher velocity. The report of the Parliamentary Commission on horseless carriages was most favourable. It urged that the steam-driven car was swifter and lighter than the mail coaches, better able to climb and descend hills, safer, more economical and less injurious to the roads, and in conclusion that the heavy charges levied at the toll gates, often twenty times those in horse vehicles, were nothing short of iniquitous. As a result of this report, motor services, inaugurated by Walter Hancock, Braithwaite and others, commenced between Paddington and the Bank, London and Greenwich, London and Windsor, London and Stratford. 
Already in 1829, Sir Charles Dance had a steam coach running between Cheltenham and Gloucester. In four months it ran 3,500 miles and carried 3,000 passengers, traversing the nine miles in three quarters of an hour, although narrow-minded landowners placed ridges of stone 18 inches deep on the road by way of protest. The most ambitious service of all was that between London and Birmingham, established in 1833 by Dr Church. The rolling stock consisted of a single very much decorated coach. The success of the road steamer seemed now assured when a cloud appeared on the horizon. It had already been too successful. The railway companies were up in arms. They saw plainly that if once the roads were covered with vehicles able to transport the public at low fares quickly from door to door on existing thoroughfares, the construction of expensive railroads would be seriously hindered, if not altogether stopped. So, taking advantage of two motor accidents, the companies appealed to Parliament, full of horse-loving squires and manufacturers who scented profit in the railways, and though scientific opinion ran strongly in favour of the steam coach, a law was passed in 1836 which rendered the steamers harmless by robbing them of their speed. The fiat went forth that in future every road locomotive should be preceded at a distance of a hundred yards by a man on foot carrying a red flag to warn passengers of its approach. This law marks the end of the first period of automobilism as far as England is concerned. At one blow it crippled a great industry, deprived the community of a very valuable means of transport and crushed the energies of many clever inventors who would soon, if we may judge by the rapid advances already made in construction, have brought the steam carriage to a high pitch of perfection. In the very year in which they were suppressed, the steam services had proved their efficiency and safety. Hancock's London service alone traversed 4,200 miles without serious accident and was so popular that the coaches were generally crowded. It is therefore hard to believe that those vehicles did not supply a public want or that they were regarded by those who used them as in any way inferior to horse-drawn coaches. Yet ignorant prejudice drove them off the road for 60 years and today it surprises many Englishmen to learn that what is generally considered a novel method of travelling was already fairly well developed in the time of their grandfathers. Second period, 1870 onwards. To follow the further development of the automobile we must cross the channel once again. French invention had not been idle while Gurney and Hancock were building their coaches. In 1835, Monsieur Dietz established a service between Versailles and Paris, and the same year, Monsieur Dazda carried out some successful trials of his steam diligence under the eyes of royalty. But we find that for the next 35 years, the steam carriage was not much improved, owing to want of capital among its French admirers. No Gurney appeared, ready to spend his thousands in experimenting. Also, though a law left road locomotion unrestricted, the railways offered a determined opposition to a possibly dangerous rival, so that, on the whole, road transport by steam fared badly till after the terrible Franco-Prussian War, when inventors again took courage. Monsieur Bolly of Mons built in 1873 a car, L'Obessante, which ran from Mons to Paris and became the subject of allusions in popular songs and plays, while its name was held up as an example to the Paris ladies. Three years later, he constructed a steam omnibus to carry 50 persons, and in 1878 exhibited a car that journeyed at the rate of 18 miles an hour from Paris to Vienna, where it aroused great admiration. After the year 1880, French engineers divided their attention between the heavy motor omnibus and light vehicles for pleasure parties. In 1884, Messrs Bouton and Trepardeau, working conjointly with the Comte de Dion, produced a steam-driven tricycle, and in 1887, Monsieur Serpilly followed suit with another, fitted with the peculiar form of steam generator that bears his name. Then came in 1890 a very important innovation, which has made automobilism what it now is. Gottlieb Daimler, a German engineer, introduced the petrol gas motor. Its comparative lightness and simplicity at once stamped it as the thing for which makers were waiting. Petrol-driven vehicles were soon abroad in considerable numbers and varieties, but they did not attract public attention to any great extent until, in 1894, Monsieur Pierre Giffard, an editor of the Petit Journal, organised a motor race from Paris to Rouen. The proprietors of the paper offered handsome prizes to the successful competitors. There were ten starters, some on steam, others on petrol cars. The race showed that, so far as stability went, Daimler's engine was the equal of the steam cylinder. The next year, another race of a more ambitious character was held, the course being from Paris to Bordeaux and back. 
Subscriptions for prizes flowed in freely. Serpoli, De Dion and Bolly prepared steam cars that should win back for steam its lost supremacy, while the petrol faction secretly built motors of a strength to relegate steam once and for all to a back place. Electricity, too, made a bid unsuccessfully for the prize in the Jean Todd car, a special train being engaged in advance to distribute charged accumulators over the route. The steamers broke down soon after the start, so that the petrol cars walked over and won a most decisive victory. The interest aroused in the race led the Comte de Dion to found the Automobile Club of France, which drew together all the enthusiastic admirers of the new locomotion. Automobilism now became a sport, a craze. The French, with their fine straight roads and a not too deeply ingrained love of horseflesh, gladly welcomed the flying car, despite its noisy and malodorous properties. Orders flowed in so freely that the motor makers could not keep pace with the demand or promise delivery within 18 months. Rich men were therefore obliged to pay double prices if they could find anyone willing to sell, a state of things that remains unto this day with certain makes of French cars. Poorer folks contented themselves with the De Dion motor tricycles, which showed up so well in the 1896 Paris to Marseille race, or with the neat little three-wheeled cars of Monsieur Bolly. Motor racing became the topic of the hour. Journals were started for the sole purpose of recording the doings of motorists, and few newspapers of any popularity omitted a special column of motor news. Successive contests on the high roads at increasing speeds attracted increased interest. The black-goggled, fur-clad chauffeur who carried off the prizes found himself a hero. In short, the hold which automobilism has over our neighbours may be gauged from the fact that in 1901 it was estimated that nearly a thousand motor cars assembled to see the sport on the Longchamps course, the scene of that ultra-horsey event, the Grand Prix, and the real interest of the meet did not centre around horses of flesh and blood. The French have not a monopoly of devotion to automobilism. The speedy motor car is too much in accord with the bustling spirit of the age, its delights too easily appreciated to be confined to one country. Allowing France the first place, America, Germany and Belgium are not far behind in their addiction to the sport, and even in Britain, partially freed since 1896 from the red flag tyranny thanks to the efforts of Sir David Salomons, there are most visible signs that the era of the horse is beginning its end. End of chapter 15 Horseless Carriages Recording by Alistair Braid, Glasgow, Scotland Chapter 16 of The Romance of Modern Invention This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams Chapter 16 Types of Car Automobiles may be classified according to the purpose they serve, according to their size and weight, or according to their motive power. We will first review them under the latter head. A. Petrol. The petrol motor, suitable alike for large cars of 40 to 60 horsepower and for the small bicycle weighing 70 pounds or so, at present undoubtedly occupies the first place in popular estimation, on account of its comparative simplicity which more than compensates certain defects that affect persons off the vehicle more than those on it. Smell and noise. The chief feature of the internal explosion motor is that at one operation it converts fuel directly into energy by exploding it inside a cylinder. It is herein more economical than steam, which loses power while passing from the boiler to the driving gear. Petrol, cycles, and small cars have usually only one cylinder, but large vehicles carry two, three, and sometimes four cylinders. Four and more avoid that bugbear of rotary motion, dead points, during which the momentum of the machinery alone is doing work, and for that reason the engines of racing cars are often quadrupled. For the sake of simplicity, we will describe the working of a single cylinder, leaving the reader to imagine it acting alone or in concert with others, as he pleases. In the first place, the fuel, petrol, 
is a very inflammable distillation of petroleum so ready to ignite that it must be most rigorously guarded from naked lights so quick to evaporate that the receptacles containing it if not quite airtight will soon render it stale and unprofitable for motor driving the engine to mention its most important parts consists of a single action cylinder giving a thrust one way only a heavy flywheel revolving in an airtight circular case and connected to the piston by a hinged rod which converts the reciprocating movement of the piston into a rotary movement of the crankshaft built in with the wheel inlet and outlet valves a carburetor for generating petrol gas and a device to ignite the gas and air mixture in the cylinder the action of the engine is as follows as the piston moves outward in its first stroke it sucks through the inlet valve a quantity of mixed air and gas the proportions of which are regulated by special taps the stroke ended the piston returns compressing the mixture and rendering it more combustible just as the piston commences its second outward stroke an electric spark passed through the mixture mechanically ignites it and creates an explosion which drives the piston violently forwards the second return forces the burnt gas through the exhaust valve which is lifted by cog gear once in every two revolutions of the crank into the silencer the cycle of operations is then repeated we see that during the three quarters of the cycle the suction compression and expulsion the work is performed entirely by the flywheel it follows that a single cylinder motor to work at all must rotate the wheel at a high rate once stopped it can be restarted only by the action of the handle or pedals a task often so unpleasant and laborious that the driver of the car when he comes to rest for a short time only disconnects his motor from the driving gear and lets it throb away idly beneath him the means of igniting the gas in the cylinders may be either a bunsen burner or an electric spark tube ignition is generally considered inferior to electrical because it does not permit timing of the explosion large cars are often fitted with both systems so as to have one in reserve should the other break down electric ignition is most commonly produced by the aid of an intensity coil which consists of an inner core of coarse insulated wire called a primary coil and an outer or secondary coil of very fine wire a current passes at intervals timed by a cam on the exhaust valve gear working a make and break contact blade from an accumulator through the primary coil exciting by induction a current of much greater intensity in the secondary the secondary is connected to a sparking plug which screws into the end of the cylinder and carries two platinum points about one thirty second of an inch apart the secondary current leaps this little gap in the circuit and the spark being intensely hot fires the compressed gas instead of accumulators a small dynamo driven by the motor is sometimes used to produce the primary current by moving a small lever known as the advancing lever the driver can control the time of explosion relatively to the compression of the gas and raise or lower the speed of the motor the strokes of the petrol driven cylinder are very rapid varying from one thousand to three thousand a minute the heat of very frequent explosions would soon make the cylinder too hot to work were not measures adopted to keep it cool small cylinders such as are carried on motorcycles are sufficiently cooled by a number of radiating ribs cast in a piece with the cylinder itself but for large machines a water jacket or tank surrounding the cylinder 
is a necessity. Water is circulated through the jacket by means of a small centrifugal pump working off the driving gear, and through a coil of pipes fixed in the front of the car to catch the draft of progression. So long as the jacket and tubes are full of water, the temperature of the cylinder cannot rise above the boiling point. Motion is transmitted from the motor to the driving wheels by intermediate gear, which in cycles may be only a leather band or a couple of cogs, but in cars is more or less complicated. Under the body of the car, running usually across it, is the countershaft, fitted at each end with a small cog, which drives a chain passing also over much larger cogs fixing to the driving wheels. The countershaft engages with the cylinder mechanism by a friction clutch, a couple of circular faces which can be pressed against one another by a lever. To start his car, the driver allows the motor to obtain a considerable momentum, and then, using the friction lever, brings more and more stress onto the countershaft until the friction clutch overcomes the inertia of the car and produces movement. Gearing, suitable for level stretches, would not be sufficiently powerful for hills. The motor would slow and probably stop from want of momentum. A car, therefore, is fitted with changing gears, which give two or three speeds, the lower for ascents, the higher for the level, and on declines, the friction clutch can be released, allowing the car to coast. B. Steam cars. Though the petrol car has come to the front of late years, it still has a powerful rival in the steam car. Inventors have made strenuous efforts to provide steam engines light enough to be suitable for small pleasure cars. At present, the local mobile American, and Serpolet, French systems, are increasing their popularity. The locomobile, the cost of which, about 120 pounds, contrasts favorably with that of even the cheaper petrol cars, has a small multi-tubular boiler wound on the outside, with two or three layers of piano wire to render it safe at high pressures. As the boiler is placed under the seat, it is only fit and proper that it should have a large margin of safety. The fuel, petrol, is passed through a specially designed burner, pierced with hundreds of fine holes, arranged in circles round air inlets. The feed supply to the burner is governed by a spring valve, which cuts off the petrol automatically as soon as the steam in the boiler reaches a certain pressure. The locomobile runs very evenly and smoothly, and with very little noise. A welcome change after the very audible explosion motor. The Serpolet system is a peculiar method of generating steam. The boiler is merely a long coil of tubing, into which a small jet of water is squirted by a pump at every stroke of the cylinders. The steam is generated and used in a moment and the speed of the machine is regulated by the amount of water thrown by the pumps. By an ingenious device, the fuel supply is controlled in combination with the water supply, so that there may not be any undue waste in the burner. C. Electricity Of electric cars there are many patterns, but at present they are not commercially so practical as the other two types. The great drawbacks to electrically driven cars are the weight of the accumulators, which often scale nearly as much as all the rest of the vehicle, and the difficulty of getting them recharged when exhausted. We might add to these the rapidity with which the accumulators become worn out, and the consequent expense of renewal. T. A. Edison is reported at work on an accumulator which will surpass all hitherto constructed, having a much longer life and weighing very much less power for power. The longest continuous run ever made with electricity, 
187 miles at Chicago, compares badly with the feat of a petrol car which, on November 23, 1900, traveled a thousand miles on the Crystal Palace track in 48 hours 24 minutes without a single stop. Successful attempts have been made by Mr. Piper and Janatsky to combine the petrol and electric systems by an arrangement which instead of wasting power in the cylinders when less speed is required throws into action electric dynamos to store up energy convertible when needed into motive power by reversing the dynamo into a motor but the simple electric car will not be a universal favorite until either accumulators are so light that a very large store of electricity can be carried without inconvenient addition of weight or until charging stations are erected all over the country at distances of fifty miles or so apart whether steam will eventually get the upper hand of the petrol engine is at present uncertain the steam car has the advantage over the gas engine car in ease of starting the delicate regulation of power, facility of reversing, absence of vibration, noise and smell, and freedom from complicated gears. On the other hand, the petrol car has no boiler to get out of order or burst, no troublesome gauges requiring constant attention, and there is a small difficulty about a supply of fuel. Petrol sufficient to give motor power for hundreds of miles can be carried if need be, and as long as there is petrol on board, the car is ready for work at a moment's notice. Judging by the number of the various types of vehicles actually at work, we should say that while steam is best for heavy traction, the gas engine is most often employed on pleasure cars. D. Liquid air will also have to be reckoned with as a motive power. At present, it is only on its probation, but the writer has good authority for stating that before these words appear in print there will be on the roads a car driven by liquid air and able to turn off 80 miles in the hour. Manufacture As the English were the pioneers of the steam car, so are the Germans and French the chief manufacturers of the petrol car. While the hands of English manufacturers were tied by short-sighted legislation, continental nations were inventing and controlling valuable patents, so that even now our manufacturers are greatly handicapped. Large numbers of petrol cars are imported annually from France, Germany, and Belgium. Steam cars come chiefly from America and France. The former country sent us nearly 2,000 vehicles in 1901, there are signs, however, that English engineers mean to make a determined effort to recover lost ground, and it is satisfactory to learn that in heavy steam vehicles, such as are turned out by Thornycroft and Company, this country holds the lead. We will hope that in a few years we shall be exporters in turn. Having glanced at the history and nature of the various types of car, it will be interesting to turn to a consideration of their traveling capacities. As we have seen, a steam omnibus attained in 1830 a speed of no less than 35 miles an hour on what we should call bad roads. It is therefore to be expected that on good modern roads, the latest types of cars would be able to eclipse the records of 70 years ago. That such has indeed been the case is evident when we examine the performances of cars in races organized as tests of speed. France, with its straight, beautifully kept military roads, is the country par excellence for the chauffeur. One only has to glance at the map to see how the main highways conform to Euclid's dictum that a straight line is the shortest distance between any two points for example, between Rowan and Deepa, where a park of artillery, well posted, could rake the road either way for miles. The growth of speed in the French races is remarkable. In 1894, the winning car ran at a mean velocity of 13 miles an hour. In 1895, a 15. The year 1898 
witnessed a great advance to twenty-three miles, and the next year to thirty miles. But all these speeds paled before that of the Paris to Bordeaux race of 1901, in which the winner, Mr. Fournier, traversed the distance of three hundred and twenty-seven and one-half miles at a rate of fifty-three and three-quarter miles per hour. The famous Sud Express, running between the same cities and considered the fastest long-distance express in the world, was beaten by a full hour. It is interesting to note that in the same races, a motor bicycle, a Werner, weighing 80 pounds or less, successfully accomplished the course at an average rate of nearly 30 miles an hour. The motor car, after waiting 70 years, had had its revenge on the railways. This was not the only occasion on which an express service showed up badly against its nimble rival of the roads. In June 1901, the French and German authorities forgot old animosities in a common enthusiasm for the automobile and organized a race between Paris and Berlin. It was to be a big affair in which the cars of all nations should fight for the speed championship. Every possible precaution was taken to ensure the safety of the competitors and the spectators. Flags of various colors and placards marked out the course, which lay through Reims, Luxembourg, Koblenz, Frankfurt, Eisenach, Leipzig, and Potsdam to the German capital. About fifty towns and large villages were neutralized. That is to say, the competitors had to consume a certain time in traversing them. At the entrance to each neutralized zone, a control was established. As soon as a competitor arrived, he must slow down, and a card on which was printed the time of his arrival was handed to a pilot who cycled in front of the car to the other control, at the farther end of the zone, from which, when the proper time had elapsed, the car was dismissed. Among other rules were that no car should be pushed or pulled during the race by anyone else than the passengers, that at the end of the day only a certain time should be allowed for cleaning and repairs, and that a limited number of persons, varying with the size of the car, should be permitted to handle it during that period. A small army of automobile club representatives besides thousands of police and soldiers, were distributed along the course to restrain the crowds of spectators. It was absolutely imperative that, for vehicles propelled at a rate from fifty to sixty miles an hour, a clear path should be kept. At dawn on July 27th, 109 racing machines assembled at the Fort de Champigny outside Paris, in readiness to start for Berlin. Just before half-past three, the first competitor received the signal. Two minutes later, the second. And then, at short intervals, for three hours, the remaining 107, among whom was one lady, Madame de Gast. At least 20,000 persons were present, even at that early hour, to give the racers a hearty farewell, and demonstrate the interest attaching in France to all things connected with automobilism. Great excitement prevailed in Paris during the three days of the race. Every few minutes, telegrams arrived from posts on the route, telling how the competitors fared. The news showed that during the first stage, at least a hard fight for the leading place was in progress. The French cracks Fournier, Charon, Dignif, Farman, and Girardot pressed hard on Horgier's number two at the starting point. Fournier soon secured the lead, and those who remembered his remarkable driving in the Paris-Bordeaux race at once selected him as the winner. A la Chapelle, 283 miles from Paris, and the end of the first stage was reached in six hours, twenty-eight minutes, Fournier first, de Knief second by six minutes. On the twenty-eighth, the racing became furious. Several accidents occurred. Edge, driving the only English car, wrecked his machine on a culvert, the sharp curve of which flung the car into the air and broke its springs. 
another ruined his chances by running over and killing a boy but fournier antony de Knief, and girardot managed to avoid mishaps for that day and covered the ground at a tremendous pace at dusseldorf girardot won the lead from fournier to lose it again shortly antony driving at a reckless speed gained ground all day and arrived a close second at hanover the halting place after a run averaging in spite of bad roads and dangerous corners no less than fifty-four miles an hour the chauffeur in such a race must indeed be a man of iron nerves through the great black goggles which shelter his face from the dust-laden hurricane set up by the speed he travels at he must keep a perpetual piercingly keen watch though travelling at express speed there are no signals to help him he must be his own signalman as well as driver he must mark every loose stone on the road every inequality every sudden rise or depression he must calculate the curves at the corners and judge whether his mechanician hanging out on the inward side will enable a car to round a turn without slackening speed his calculations and decisions must be made in the fraction of a second for a moment's hesitation might be disaster his driving must be furious and not reckless the timid chauffeur will never win the careless one will probably lose his head must be cool although the car leaps beneath him like a wild thing and the wind lashes his face at least one well-tried driver found the mere mental strain too great to bear and retired from the contest and we may be sure that a few of the competitors slept much during the nights of the race at four o'clock on the twenty-ninth fournier started on the third stage which witnessed another bout of fast travelling it was now a struggle between him and Antony for first place. The pace rose at times to eighty miles an hour, a speed at which our fastest expresses seldom travel. Such a speed means huge risks. For stopping, even with the powerful brakes fitted to the large cars, would be a matter of a hundred yards or more. Not far from Hanover, Antony met with an accident. Girardot now held second place, and Fournier finished an easy first. All along the route, crowds had cheered him, and hurled bouquets into the car, and wished him good speed. But in Berlin, the assembled populace went nearly frantic at his appearance. Fournier was overwhelmed with flowers, laurel wreaths, and other offerings, dukes duchesses and the great people of the land pressed for presentations he was the hero of the hour thus ended what may be termed a peaceful invasion of germany by the french among other things it had shown that over an immense stretch of country over roads in places bad as only german roads can be the automobile was able to maintain an average speed superior to that of the express trains running between paris and berlin also that in spite of the large number of cars employed in the race the accidents to the public were a negligible quantity it should be mentioned that the actual time occupied by fournier was sixteen hours five minutes that out of the one hundred and nine starters forty seven reached berlin and that osmond on a motorcycle finished only three hours and ten minutes behind the winner in england such racing would be undesirable and impossible owing to the crookedness of our roads it would certainly not be permissible so long as the twelve miles an hour limit is observed at the present time an agitation is on foot against this restriction which though reasonable enough among traffic and in towns appears unjustifiable in open country to help to convince the magisterial mind of the ease with which a car can be stopped and therefore of its safety even at comparatively high speeds trials were held on january second nineteen o two in welbeck park 
the results showed that a car traveling at thirteen miles an hour could be stopped dead in four yards at eighteen miles in seven yards at twenty miles in thirteen yards or in less than half the distance required to pull up a horse vehicle driven at similar speeds uses ninety five per cent of motors at least in england are attached to pleasure vehicles cycles voiturettes and large cars on account of the costliness of cars motorists are far less numerous than cyclists but those people whose means enable them to indulge in automobilism find it extremely fascinating caricaturists have presented to us in plenty the gloomier incidents of motoring the broken chain the burst tire the something gone wrong it requires personal experience to understand how lightly these mishaps weigh against the exhilaration of movement the rapid change of scene the sensation of control over power which can whirl one along tirelessly at a pace altogether beyond the capacities of horseflesh if proof were wanted of the motor car's popularity it will be seen in the unconventional dress of the chauffeur the breeze set up by his rapid rush is such as would penetrate ordinary clothing he dons cumbrous fur cloaks the dust is all-pervading at times he swathes himself in dust-proof overalls and mounts large goggles edged with velvet while a cap of semi-nautical cut tightly drawn down over his neck and ears serves to protect those portions of his anatomy the general effect is peculiarly unpicturesque but even the most artistically minded driver is ready to sacrifice appearances to comfort and the proper enjoyment of his car in england the great grievance of motorists arise from the speed limit imposed by law to restrict a powerful car to twelve miles an hour is like confining a thoroughbred to the paces of a broken-down cab horse carelessly driving is unpardonable but its occasional existence scarcely justifies the intolerant attitude of the law towards motorists in general it must however be granted in justice to the police that the chauffeur from constant transgression of the law becomes a bad judge of speed and often travels at a far greater velocity than he is willing to admit the convenience of the motor-car for many purposes is immense especially for cross-country journeys which may be made from door to door without the monotony or indirectness of railway travel it bears the doctor swiftly on his rounds it carries the business man from his country house to his office it delivers goods for the merchant parcels for the post office in the warfare of the future too it will play its part whether to drag heavy ordnance or in stores or to move commanding officers from point to point or perform errands of mercy among the wounded by the courtesy of the locomobile company we are permitted to append the testimony of captain r s walker r e to the usefulness of a car during the great boer war several months ago i noticed a locomobile car at cape town and being struck with its simplicity and neatness bought it and took it up country with me with a view to making some tests with it over bad roads etc its first trip was over a rough course round pretoria especially chosen to find out defects before taking it into regular use naturally as the machine was not designed for this class of work there were several in about a month these had all been found out and remedied and the car was in constant use taking stores etc around the towns and forts it also performed some very useful work in visiting out stations where searchlights were either installed or wanted and in this way visited nearly all the bigger towns in the transvaal it was possible to go round all the likely positions for a searchlight in one day at every station which frequently means considerably over fifty miles of most indifferent roads more than a single horse could have been expected to do and the car generally carried two persons on these occasions 
the car was also used as a tender to a searchlight plant or a gun carriage and limber being utilized to fetch gasoline carbons water etc etc and also to run the dynamo for charging the accumulators used for sparking thus saving running the gasoline motor for this purpose to do this the trail of the carriage on which was the dynamo was lowered on to the ground the back of the car was pulled up one wheel being supported on the dynamo pulley and the other clear of the ground and two bolts were passed through the balance gear to join it on one occasion the car ran a thirty c m searchlight for an hour driving a dynamo in this way in consequence of this a trailer has been made to carry a dynamo and projector for searchlighting in the field but so far this has not been so used the trailer hooks into an eye passing just behind the balance gear a maxim colt or small ammunition cart etc could be attached to the same eye undoubtedly the best piece of work done by the car so far was its trial trip with the trailer when it blew up the mines at klein neck these mines were laid some eight months previously and had never been looked to in the interval there had been several bad storms the boars and cattle had been frequently through the neck it had been on fire and finally it was shelled with lightite the mines eighteen in number were found to be intact except two which presumably had been fired off by the heat of the veld fire all the insulation was burnt off the wires and the battery was useless it had been anticipated that a dynamo exploder would be inadequate to fire these mines so a two hundred and fifty volt two horsepower motor which happened to be in pretoria weighing about three or four hundred weight was placed on the trailer a quarter of a mile of insulated cable some testing gear the kits of three men and their rations for three days with the case of gasoline for the car were also carried on the car and trailer and the whole left pretoria one morning and trekked to Rietfontein. two of us were mounted the third drove the car at Rietfontein we halted for the night and started next morning with an escort through commando neck round the north of the Magaliasburg to near klein neck where the road had to be left and the car taken across country through bushveld at the bottom the going was pretty easy only a few bushes had to be charged down and the grass etc rather wound itself round the wheels and chain as the rise became steeper the stones became very large and the car had to be taken along very gingerly to prevent breaking the wheels a halt was made about a quarter of a mile from the top of the neck where the mines were these were reconnoitred and the wire etc was picked up the portion which was useless was placed on top of the charges and the remainder taken to the car the dynamo was slid off the trailer the car backed against it one wheel was raised slightly and placed against the dynamo pulley which was held up to it by a man using his rifle as a lever the other wheel was on the ground with a stone under it the balance gear being free the dynamo was excited without the other wheel moving and the load being on for a very short time that is from the time of touching lead on dynamo terminal to firing of the mine no harm could come to the car when all the leads had been joined to the dynamo the car was started and after a short time when it was judged to have excited the second terminal was touched a bang of clouds of dust resulted and the klein neck minefield had ceased to exist the day was extremely hot and the work had not been light so the tea made with the water drawn from the boiler which we were able to serve round to the main body of our escort was much appreciated and washed down the surplus rations we dispensed with to accommodate the battery and wire which we could not leave behind for the enemy on the return journey we found this extra load too much for the car and had great difficulty getting up to commando neck frequently having to stop to get up steam so these materials were left at the first blockhouse and the journey home continued in comfort a second night at retontaine gave us a rest after our labor and the third afternoon saw us on our way back to pretoria as luck would have it a sandstorm overtook the car which had a lively time of it the storm began by blowing the sole occupant's hat off so the two mounted men being a long way behind he shut off steam and chased his hat in the meantime 
the wind increased and the car sailed off on its own and was only just caught in time to save a smash luckily the gale was in the right direction for the fire was blown out and it was impossible to light a match in the open the car sailed into a port in the outskirts of pretoria got a tow from a friendly cart through it and then steamed home after the fire had been relit the load carried on this occasion without the battery etc must have been at least five hundred weight beside the driver which considering the car is designed to carry two on ordinary roads and that these roads were by no means ordinary was no mean feat the car as ordinarily equipped for trekking carries the following blankets waterproof sheets etc for two men four planks for crossing ditches bogs stones etc all necessary tools and spare parts a day supply of gasoline a couple of telephones and one mile of wire in addition on the trailer if used for searchlighting one thirty cm projector one automatic lamp for projector one dynamo one hundred volts twenty amperes two short lengths of wire two pairs of carbons tools etc this trailer would normally be carried with the baggage and only picked up by the car when wanted as a light that is as a rule after arriving in camp when a good many other things could be left behind perhaps the most useful work in store for the motor is to help relieve the congestion of our large towns and to restore to the country some of its lost prosperity there is no stronger inducement to make people live in the country than rapid and safe means of locomotion whether public or private at present the slow and congested suburban train services on some sides of london consume as much time as would suffice a motor-car to cover twice or three times the distance we must welcome any form of travel which will tend to restore the balance between country and town by enabling the worker to live far from his work the gain to the health of the nation arising from more even distribution of population would be inestimable a world's tours among the latest projects in automobilism on april twenty ninth nineteen o two dr lavis and nine friends started from hyde park corner for a nine months tour on three vehicles the largest of them a luxuriously appointed twenty-four horsepower caravan built to accommodate four persons their route lies through france germany russia siberia china japan and the united states end of chapter sixteen Chapter 17 of The Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alistair Braid, Glasgow, Scotland. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter 17 High Speed Railways. A century ago, a long journey was considered an exploit, and an exploit to be carried through as quickly as possible on account of the dangers of the road and the generally uncomfortable conditions of travel. Today, though our express speed is many times greater than that of the lumbering coaches, our carriages comparatively luxurious, the risk practically nil, the same wish lurks in the breast of 99 out of 100 railway passengers to spend the shortest time in the train that the timetable permits of. Time differences that, to our grandfathers, would have appeared trifling are now matters of sufficient importance to make rival railway companies anxious to clip a few minutes off a 100-mile run simply because their passengers appreciate a few minutes less confinement to the cars. During the last 50 years, the highest express speeds have not materially altered. The Great Western Company, in its early days, ran trains from Paddington to Slough, 18 miles, in 15 and a half minutes, or at an average pace of 69 and a half miles an hour. On turning to the present regular express services of the world, we find America heading the list, with a 50 mile run between Atlantic City and Camden, covered at the average speed of 68 miles an hour, 
Britain second with a 33 mile run between Forfar and Perth at 59 miles and France a good third with an hourly average of rather more than 58 miles between Les Aubrey and saint pierre de corps These runs are longer than that on the Great Western Railway referred to above, which now occupies 24 minutes, but their average speed velocity is less. What is the cause of this decrease of speed? Not want of power in modern engines, at times our trains attain a rate of 80 miles an hour, and in America a mile has been turned off in the astonishing time of 32 seconds. We should rather seek it in the need for economy and the physical limitations imposed by the present system of plate laying and railroad engineering. An average speed of 90 miles an hour would, as things now stand, be too wasteful of coal and too injurious to the rolling stock to yield profit to the proprietors of a line, and, except in certain districts, would prove perilous for the passengers. Before our services can be much improved, the steam locomotive must be supplanted by some other application of motive power, and the metals be laid in a manner which will make special provision for extreme speed. Since rapid transit is as much a matter of commercial importance as of mere personal convenience, it must not be supposed that an average of 50 miles an hour will continue to meet the needs of travellers. Already, practical experiments have been made with two systems that promise us an ordinary speed of 100 miles an hour and an express speed considerably higher. One of these, the monorail or single rail system, will be employed on a railroad projected between Manchester and Liverpool. At present, passengers between these two cities, the first to be connected by a railroad of any kind, enjoy the choice of three rival services covering 34 and a half miles in three quarters of an hour. An eminent engineer, Mr F. B. Beher, now wishes to add a fourth of unprecedented swiftness. Parliamentary powers have been secured for a line starting from Deansgate, Manchester, and terminating behind the Pro Cathedral in Liverpool, on which single cars will run every 10 minutes at a velocity of 110 miles an hour. A monorail track presents a rather curious appearance. The ordinary parallel metals are replaced by a single rail carried on the summit of A-shaped trestles, the legs of which are firmly bolted to sleepers. A monorail car is divided lengthwise by a gap that allows it to hang half on either side of the trestles and clear them as it moves. The double flanged wheels to carry and drive the car are placed at the apex of the gap. As the centre of gravity is below the rail, the car cannot turn over, even when travelling round a sharp curve. The first railway built on this system was constructed by Monsieur Charles Lartigue, a French engineer in Algeria, a district where an ordinary two-rail track is often blocked by severe sandstorms. He derived the idea of balancing trucks over an elevated rail from caravans of camels laden on each flank with large bags. The camel, or rather its legs, was transformed by the engineer's eye into iron trestles, while its burden became a car. A line built as a result of this observation, and supplied with mules as tractive power, has for many years played an important part in the esparto grass trade of Algeria. In 1886, Mr. Behr decided that by applying steam to Monsieur Lartigue's system, he could make it successful as a means of transporting passengers and goods. He accordingly set up in Tothill Fields, Westminster, on the site of the new Roman Catholic Cathedral, a miniature railway which, during nine months of use, showed that the monorail would be practical for heavy traffic, safe and more cheaply maintained than the ordinary double metal railway. The train travelled easily round very sharp curves and climbed unusually steep gradients without slipping. Mr. Behr was encouraged to construct a monorail in Kerry between Listowel, a country town famous for its butter, and Ballybunion, a seaside resort of increasing popularity. The line, opened on the 28th of February 1888, has worked most satisfactorily ever since, without injury to a single employee or passenger. On each side of the trestles, two feet below the apex, run two guide rails, against which press small wheels attached to the carriages to prevent undue oscillation and tipping round curves. At the three stations, there are, instead of points, turntables or switches onto which the train runs for transference to sidings. 
Road traffic crosses the rail on drawbridges, which are very easily worked, and which automatically set signals against the train. The bridges are in two portions and act on the principle of the tower bridge, each half falling from a perpendicular position towards the centre, where the ends rest on the rail, specially strengthened at that spot to carry the extra weight. The locomotive is a twin affair, has two boilers, two funnels, two fireboxes, can draw 240 tonnes on the level at 15 miles an hour, and when running light travels a mile in two minutes. The carriages, 18 feet long and carrying 12 passengers on each side, are divided longitudinally into two parts. Trucks too are used, mainly for the transport of sand, of which each carries three tonnes, from Ballybunion to Lustowell, and in the centre of each train is a queer looking vehicle serving as a bridge for anyone who may wish to cross from one side of the rail to the other. Several lines on the pattern of the Ballybunion Lustowell have been erected in different countries. Mr. Bear was not satisfied with his first success, however, and determined to develop the monorail in the direction of fast travelling, which he thought would be most easily attained on a trestle track. In 1893, he startled engineers by proposing a lightning express service to transport passengers at a velocity of 120 miles an hour. But the project seemed too ideal to tempt money from the pockets of financiers, and Mr. Bear soon saw that if a high-speed railway after his own heart were constructed, it must be at his own expense. He had sufficient faith in his scheme to spend £40,000 on an experimental track at the Brussels Exhibition of 1897. The exhibition was in two parts, connected by an electric railway, the one at the capital and the other at Tevuren, seven miles away. Mr. Bear built his line at Tevuren. The greatest difficulty he encountered in its construction arose from the opposition of landowners, mostly small peasant proprietors, who were anxious to make advantageous terms before they would hear of the rail passing through their lands. Until he had concluded 200 separate contracts, by most of which the peasants benefited, his plate layers could not get to work. Apart from this opposition, the conditions were not favourable. He was obliged to bridge no less than 10 roads, and the contour of the country necessitated steep gradients, sharp curves, long cuttings and embankments, the last of which, owing to a wet summer, could not be trusted to stand quite firm. The track was doubled for three miles, passing at each end round a curve of 1,600 feet radius. The rail ran about four feet above the track on trestles, bolted down to steel sleepers resting on ordinary ballast. The carriage, Mr. Bear used but one on this line, weighed 68 tonnes, was 59 feet long and 11 feet wide, and could accommodate 100 persons. It was handsomely fitted up and had specially shaped seats, which neutralised the effect of rounding curves, and ended fore and aft in a point to overcome the wind resistance in front and the air suction behind. Sixteen pairs of wheels on the underside of the carriage engaged with the two pairs of guide rails flanking the trestles, and eight large double-flanged wheels, four and a half feet in diameter, carried the weight of the vehicle. The inner four of these wheels were driven by as many powerful electric motors contained, along with the guiding mechanism in the lower part of the car. The motors picked up current from the centre rail and from another steel rail laid along the sleepers on porcelain insulators. The top speed attained was about 90 miles an hour. On the close of the exhibition, special experiments were made at the request of the Belgian, French and Russian governments, with results that proved that the Bear system deserved a trial on a much larger scale. The engineer accordingly approached the British government with a bill for the construction of a high-speed line between Liverpool and Manchester. A committee of the House of Commons rejected the bill on representations of the Salford Corporation. The committee had to admit, nevertheless, that the evidence called was mainly in favour of the system, and, the plans of the rail having been altered to meet certain objections, parliamentary consent was obtained to commence operations when the necessary capital had been subscribed. In a few years, the great seaport and the great cotton town will probably be within a few minutes' run of each other. A question that naturally arises in the mind of the reader is this. Could the cars, when travelling at 110 miles an hour, be arrested quickly enough to avoid an accident if anything got on the line? The Westinghouse air brake has a retarding force of 3 miles a second. 
It would therefore arrest a train travelling at 110 miles an hour in 37 seconds, or 995 yards. Mr. Bear produces to reinforce the Westinghouse with an electric brake, composed of magnets 18 inches long, exerting on the guide rails by means of current generated by the reverse motors an attractive force of 200 pounds per square inch. One great advantage of this brake is that its efficiency is greatest when the speed of the train is highest and when it is most needed. The United brakes are expected to stop the car in half the distance of the Westinghouse alone, but they would not both be applied except in emergencies. Under ordinary conditions, the slowing of a car would take place only at the termini, where the line ascends gradients into the stations. There would, however, be small chance of collisions, the railway being securely fenced off throughout its entire length, and free from level crossings, drawbridges and points. Furthermore, each train would be its own signalman. Suppose the total 34.5 miles divided into block lengths of 7 miles. On leaving a terminus, the train sets a danger signal behind it. At 7 miles, it sets another, and at 14 miles, releases the first signal, so that the driver of a car would have at least 7 miles to slow down after seeing the signals against him. In the case of fog, he would consult a miniature signal in his cabin, working electrically in unison with the large semaphores. The Manchester-Liverpool rail will be reserved for express traffic only. Mr. Beher does not believe in mixing speeds and considers it one of the advantages of his system that slow cars and wagons of the ordinary two-rail type cannot be run on the monorail because if they could, managers might be tempted to place them there. A train will consist of a single vehicle for 40, 50 or 70 passengers as the occasion requires. It is calculated that an average of 12 passengers at one penny per mile would pay all the expenses of running a car. Mr. Bear maintains that monorails can be constructed far more cheaply than the two rail because they permit sharper curves and thereby save a lot of cutting and embankment and also because the monorail itself, when trestles and rail are specially strengthened, can serve as its own bridge across roads, valleys and rivers. Though the single rail has come to the front of late, it must not be supposed that the two rail track is forever doomed to moderate speeds only. German engineers have built an electric two-rail military line between Berlin and Zossen, 17 miles long, over which cars have been run at 100 miles an hour. The line has very gradual curves and in this respect is inferior to the more sinuous monorail. Its chief virtue is the method of applying motive power, a method common to both systems. The steam locomotive creates its own motive force and as long as it has fuel and water can act independently. The electric locomotive, on the other hand, receives its power through metallic conductors from some central station. Should the current fail, all the traffic on the line is suspended. So far, the advantage rests with the steamer. But as regards economy, the superiority of the current is obvious. In the electric systems, under consideration, the monorail and berlin zossen there is less weight per passenger to be shifted, since a comparatively light motor supersedes the heavy locomotive. The cars running singly, bridges and track are subjected to less strain and cost less to keep in repair. But the greatest saving of all is made in fuel. A steam locomotive uses coal wastefully, sending a lot of latent power up the funnel in the shape of half-expanded steam. Want of space prevents the designer from fitting to a moving engine the more economical machinery to be found in the central power station of an electric railway, which may be so situated by the water side or near a pit's mouth, that fuel can be brought to it at a trifling cost. Not only is the expense of distributing coal over the system avoided, but the coal itself, by the help of triple and quadruple expansion engines, should yield two or three times as much energy per tonne as is developed in a locomotive's furnace. Many schemes are afoot for the construction of high-speed railways. The South Eastern plans a monorail between Cannon Street and Charing Cross, to avoid the delay that at present occurs in passing from one station to the other. We hear also of a projected railway from London to Brighton, which will reduce the journey to half an hour, and of another to connect Dover and London. It has even been suggested to establish monorails on existing tracks for fast passenger traffic. The express is passing overhead, the slow and goods trains plodding along the double metals below. 
But the most ambitious programme of all comes from the land of the Tsar, Monsieur Hippotle Romanov, a Russian engineer, proposes to unite St. Petersburg and Moscow by a line that shall cover the intervening 600 miles in three hours, an improvement of 10 hours on the present timetables. He will use T-shaped supports to carry two rails, one on each arm, from which the cars are to hang. The line being thus double will permit the cars, some 400 in number, to run to and fro continuously, urged on their way by current picked up from overhead wires. Each car is to have 12 wheels, four drivers arranged vertically and eight horizontally, to prevent derailment by gripping the rail on either side. The stoppage or breakdown of any car will automatically stop those following by cutting off the current. In the early days of railway history, lines were projected in all directions, regardless of the fact whether they would be of any use or not. Many of these lines began where they ended, on paper. And now that the high speed question has cropped up, we must not believe that every projected electric railway will be built. Though of the ultimate prevalence of far higher speeds than we now enjoy, there can be no doubt. The following is a timetable drawn up on the two mile per minute basis. A man leaving London at 10am would reach Brighton, 50 miles away, at 10.25am. Portsmouth, 60 miles away, at 10.30am. Birmingham, 113 miles away, at 10.57am. Leeds, 188 miles away, at 11.34am. Liverpool, 202 miles away, at 11.41am. Holyhead, 262 miles away, at 12.11pm. Edinburgh, 400 miles away, at 1.20pm. And Aberdeen, 540 miles away, at 2.30pm. What would become of the records established in the race to the north and by American flyers? And what about continental travel? Assuming that the Channel Tunnel is built, perhaps a rather large assumption, Paris will be at our very doors. A commercial traveller will step into the Lightning Express at London, sleep for 2 hours and 24 minutes, and wake, refreshed, to find the blue-smocked Paris porters bawling in his ear. Or, even if we prefer to keep the little silver streak free from subterranean burrows, he will be able to catch the swift turbine steamers, of which more anon, at Dover, slip across to Calais in half an hour and be at the French capital within four hours of quitting London. And if Monsieur Romanoff's standard be reached, the latest thing in hats, dispatched from Paris at noon, may be worn in Regent Street before two o'clock. Such speeds would indeed produce a revolution in travelling comparable to the substitution of the steam locomotive for the stagecoach. As has been pithily said, the effect of steam was to make the bulk of population travel, whereas they had never travelled before. But the effect of the electric railway will be to make those who travel, travel much further and much oftener. End of chapter 17, High Speed Railways. Recording by Alistair Braid, Glasgow, Scotland. Chapter 18 of The Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter 18 C. Expresses. In the year 1836, the Sirius a paddle-wheel vessel, crossed the Atlantic from Cork Harbor to New York in 19 days. Contrast with the first steam passage from the Old World to the New, a return journey of the Deutschland, a North German liner, which in 1900 averaged over 27 miles an hour between Sandy Hook and Plymouth, accomplishing the whole distance in the record time of 5 days, 7 hours, 38 minutes. This growth of speed is even more remarkable than might appear from the mere comparison of figures. A body moving through water is so retarded by the inertia and friction of the fluid that to quicken its pace, a force quite out of proportion to the increase of velocity must be exerted. The proportion cannot be reduced to an exact formula, 
but under certain conditions the speed and the power required advance in the ratio of their cubes. That is, to double a given rate of progress, eight times the drive power is needed, to treble it, twenty-seven times. The mechanism of our fast modern vessels is in every way as superior to that which moved the Sirius, as the beautifully adjusted safety cycle is to the clumsy bone shaker which passed for a wonder among our grandfathers. A great improvement has also taken place in the art of building ships on lines calculated to offer least resistance to the water, and at the same time afford a good carrying capacity. The big liner, with its knife-edged bow and tapering hull, is, by its shape alone, eloquent of the high speed which has earned it the title of the Ocean Greyhound. And as for the fastest craft of all, torpedo destroyers, their designers seem to have kept in mind Euclid's definition of a line, length without breadth. But whatever its shape, boat or ship may not shake itself free of nature's laws. Her restraining hand lies heavy upon it. A single man paddles his weight-carrying dinghy along easily at four miles an hour. Eight men in the pink of condition, after arduous training, cannot urge their light, slender racing shell more than twelve miles in the same time. To understand how mail boats and destroyers attain, despite the enormous resistance of water, velocities that would shame many a train surface, we have only to visit the stokeholds and engine rooms of our sea expresses and note the many devices of marine engineers by which fuel is converted into speed. We enter the stokehold through airlocks, closing one door before we can open the other, and find ourselves among sweating, grimy men, stripped to the waist. As though life itself depended upon it, they shovel coal into the rapacious maws of the furnaces, glowing with a dazzling glare under the forced draft sent down into the hold by the fans whirling overhead. The ignited furnace gases on their way to the outer air surrender a portion of their heat to the water from which they are separated by a skin of steel. Two kinds of marine boiler are used, the fire tube and the water tube. In fire tube boilers, the fire passes inside the tubes and the water outside. In water tube boilers, the reverse is the case, the crown and sides of the furnace being composed of sheaths of small parallel pipes through which water circulates. The latter type, as generating steam very quickly, and being able to bear very high pressures, is most often found in war vessels of all kinds. The quality sought in boiler construction is that the heating surface should be very large in proportion to the quantity of water to be heated. Special coal, anthracite, or Welsh, is used in the Navy on account of its great heating power and freedom from smoke. Experiments have also been made with crude petroleum, or liquid fuel, which can be more quickly put on board than coal, requires the services of fewer stokers, and may be stored in odd corners unavailable as coal bunkers. From the boiler, the steam passes to the engine room, whither we will follow it. We are now in a bewildering maze of clanking, whirling machinery. Our nose is offended by the reek of oil, our ears deafened by the uproar of the moving metal, our eyes wearied by the efforts to follow the motions of the cranks and rods. On either side of us is ranged a series of three or perhaps even four cylinders of increasing size. The smallest, known as the high-pressure cylinder, receives steam direct from the boiler. It takes in through a slide valve a supply for a stroke. Its piston is driven from end to end. The piston rod flies through the cylinder end and transmits a rotary motion to a crank by means of a connecting rod. The half-expanded steam is then ejected, not into the air, as would happen on a locomotive, but into the next cylinder, which has a larger piston to compensate the reduction in pressure. Number two served, the steam does duty a third time in number three, and perhaps yet a fourth time before it reaches the condensers, where its sudden conversion into water by cold produces a vacuum suction in the last cylinder of the series. The secret of a marine engine's strength and economy lies then in its treatment of the steam, which, like clothes in a numerous family, is not thought to have served its purpose till it has been used over and over again. Reciprocating, i.e. cylinder, engines, though brought to a high pitch of efficiency, have grave disadvantages. The greatest among them is the annoyance caused by their intense vibrations to all persons in the vessel. A revolving body that is not exactly balanced runs unequally, and transmits a tremor to anything with which it might be in contact. Turn a cycle upside down and revolve a drive wheel rapidly by means of the pedal. The whole machine soon begins to tremble violently, and dance up and down on the saddle springs, because one part of the wheel is heavier than the rest the mere weight of the air valve being sufficient to disturb the balance. Now consider what happens in the engine room of high-powered vessels. On destroyers, the screws make 400 revolutions a minute. That is to say, all the momentum of the pistons, cranks, rods, and valves, weighing tons, has to be arrested 13 or 14 times each second. 
however well the moving parts may be balanced, the vibration is felt from stem to stern of the vessel. Even on luxuriously appointed liners, with engines running at a far slower speed, the throbbing of the screw, i.e. engines, is only too noticeable and productive of discomfort. We shall be told, perhaps, that vibration is a necessary consequence of speed. This is true enough of all vehicles, such as railway trains, motor cars, cycles, which are shaken by the irregularities of the unyielding surface over which they run, but does not apply universally to ships and boats. A sail or oar-powered craft may be entirely free from vibration, whatever its speed, as the motions arising from water are usually slow and deliberate. In fact, water in its calmer moods is an ideal medium to travel on, and the trouble begins only with the introduction of steam as the motive force. But even steam may be robbed of its power to annoy us. The steam turbine has arrived. It works a screw propeller as smoothly as a dynamo, and at a speed that no cylinder engine could maintain for a minute without shaking itself to pieces. The steam turbine is most closely connected with the name of the Honorable Charles Parsons, son of Lord Rossi, the famous astronomer. He was the first to show, in his speedy little turbina, the possibilities of the turbine when applied to steam navigation. The results have been such as to attract the attention of the whole shipbuilding world. The principle of the turbine is seen in the ordinary windmill. To an axle revolving in a stationary bearing are attached vanes which oppose a current of air, water, or steam at an angle to its course, and by it are moved sideways through a circular path. Mr. Parsons' turbine has of course been specially adapted for the action of steam. It consists of a cylindrical airtight chest, inside which rotates a drum, fitted round its circumference with rows of curved vanes. The chest itself has fixed immovably to its inner side a corresponding number of vane rings, alternating with those on the drum, and so arranged as to deflect the steam on to the latter at the most efficient angle. The diameter of the chest and drum is not constant, but increases towards the exhaust end, in order to give the expanding and weakening steam a larger leverage as it proceeds. The steam entering the chest from the boiler at a pressure of some hundreds of pounds to the square inch strikes the first set of vanes on the drum, passes them and meets the first set of chest vanes, is turned from its course onto the second set of drum vanes, and so on to the other end of the chest. Its power arises entirely from its expansive velocity, which, rather than turn a number of sharp corners, will, if possible, compel the obstruction to move out of its way. If that obstruction be from any cause difficult to stir, the steam must pass round it until its passage overcomes the inertia. Consequently, the turbine differs from the cylinder engine in this respect, that steam can pass through and be wasted without doing any work at all, whereas, unless the gear of a cylinder moves, and power is exerted, all steamways are closed, and there is no waste. In practice, therefore, it is found that a turbine is most efficient when running at high speed. The first steam turbines were used to drive dynamos. In 1884, Mr. Parsons made a turbine in which 15 wheels of increasing size moved at the astonishing rate of 300 revolutions per second, and developed 10 horsepower. In 1888 followed a 120 horsepower turbine, and in 1892 one of 2,000 horsepower, provided with a condenser to produce suction. So successful were these steam fans for electrical work, pumping water, and ventilating mines, that Mr. Parsons determined to test them as a means of propelling ships. A small vessel 100 feet long and 9 feet in beam was fitted with three turbines, high, medium, and low pressure, of a total of 2,000 horsepower, a proportion of motive force to tonnage, hitherto not approached. Yet when tried over the test course, the turbina, as the boat was fitly named, ran in a most disappointing fashion. The screws revolved too fast, producing what is known as cavitation, or the scooping out of the water by the screws, so that they moved in a partial vacuum and utilized only a fraction of their force, from lack of anything to bite on. This defect was remedied by employing screws of coarser pitch and larger blade area, three of which were attached to each of the three propeller shafts. On a second trial, the turbina attained thirty-two and three-quarters knots over the measured mile, and later the astonishing speed of forty miles an hour, or double that of the fast channel packets. At the Spithead Review in 1897, one of the most interesting sights was the little nimble turbina rushing up and down the rows of majestic warships at a rate of an express train. After this success, Mr. Parsons erected works at wallsend on tyne for the special manufacturer of turbines. The Admiralty soon placed with him an order for a torpedo destroyer, the Viper, of 350 tons, which on its trial trip exceeded 41 miles an hour at an estimated horsepower, 11,000, equaling that of our largest battleships. 
a sister vessel, the Cobra, of like size, proved as speedy. Misfortune, however, overtook both destroyers. The Viper was wrecked August 3, 1901, on the coast of Alderney, during the autumn naval maneuvers, and the Cobra foundered in a severe storm on September 12th of the same year in the North Sea. This double disaster cast no reflections on the turbine engines, being attributed to fog in the one case and to structural weakness in the other. The Admiralty has since ordered another turbine destroyer, and before many years are passed, we shall probably see all the great naval powers providing themselves with light craft to act as the eyes of the fleet, and travel at even higher speeds than those of the Viper and Cobra. The turbine has been applied to mercantile as well as warlike purposes. There is at the present time a turbine-propelled steamer, the King Edward, running in the Clyde on the fairly Campbellton route. This vessel, 250 foot long, 30 broad, 18 deep, contains three turbines. In each, the steam is expanded five-fold, so that by the time it passes into the condensers, it occupies 125 times its boiler volume. On the Viper, the steam entered the turbine through an air inlet eight inches in diameter, and left them by an outlet four feet square. In cylinder engines, 32-fold expansion is considered a high ratio. Hence the turbine extracts a great deal more power in proportion from its steam. As a turbine cannot be reversed, special turbines are attached to the two outside of the three propeller shafts to drive the vessel astern. The steamer attained twenty and a half knots over the Skelmory Mile in fair and calm weather, with 3,500 horsepower produced at the turbines. The King Edward is thus the fastest by two or three knots of all the Clyde steamers, as she is the most comfortable. We are assured that as far as the turbines are concerned, it is impossible, by placing the hand upon the steam chest, to tell whether the drum inside is revolving or not. Every marine engine is judged by its economy in the consumption of coal. Except in times of national peril, extra speed produced by an extravagant use of fuel would be severely avoided by all owners and captains of ships. At slow speeds the turbine develops less power than cylinders from the same amount of steam, but when working at high velocity it gives at least equal results. A careful record kept by the managers of the Caledonian Steamship Company compares the King Edward with the Duchess of Hamilton, a paddle steamer of equal tonnage used on the same route and built by the same firm. The record shows that though the paddle boat ran a fraction of a mile further for every ton of coal burnt in the furnaces, the King Edward averaged two knots an hour faster, a superiority of speed quite out of proportion to the slight excess of fuel. Were the Duchess driven at eighteen and a half knots instead of sixteen and a half, her coal bill would far exceed that of the turbine. As an outcome of these first trials, the Caledonian Company are launching a second turbine vessel. Three high-speed turbine yachts are also on the stocks, one of 700 tons, another of 1,500 tons, and a third of 170 tons. The last, the property of Colonel McCalmont, is designed for a speed of 24 knots. Mr. Parsons claims for his system the following advantages. Greatly increased speed, increased carrying power of coal, economy in coal consumption, increased facilities for navigating shallow waters, greater stability of vessels, reduced weight of machinery. The turbines of the King Edward weigh but one half of cylinders required to give the same power. Cheapness of attending the machinery. Absence of vibration, lessening wear and tear of the ship's hull and assisting the accurate training of guns. Lowered center of gravity in the vessel, and consequent greater safety during times of war. The inventor has suggested a cruiser of 2,800 tons, engined up to 80,000 horsepower, to yield a speed of 44 knots, about 50 miles an hour. Figures such as these suggest that we may be on the eve of a revolution of ocean travel comparable to that made by the substitution of steam for wind power. Whether the steam turbine will make for increased speed all round, or for greater economy, remains to be seen. But we may be assured of a higher degree of comfort. We can easily believe that improvements will follow in this as in other mechanical contrivances, and that the turbine's efficiency has not yet reached a maximum. And, if our ocean expresses, naval and mercantile, do not attain the one-mile-a-minute standard, which is still regarded as credible to the fastest methods of land locomotion, we look forward to a time in the near future when much higher speeds will prevail, and the tedium of long voyages be greatly shortened. Already there is talk of a service which shall reduce the transatlantic journey to three and a half days. The means are at hand to make it a fact. Note. In the recently launched turbine destroyer Velux, a novel feature is the introduction of ordinary reciprocating engines fitted into conjunction with the steam turbines. These engines are of triple compound type, and are coupled direct to the main turbines. They take steam from the boilers direct and exhaust into the high-speed turbine. These reciprocating engines are for use at cruising speeds. 
When higher power is needed, the steam will be admitted to the turbines direct from the boilers, and the cylinders will be thrown out of gear. End of chapter 18 Recording by Todd